What's up, everybody? I'm Chris Daly, joined here by the man in the yellow tuxedo, uh, Jesse Cole, who owns the Savannah Bananas. So, Jesse, uh, you know, thank you for joining us. Chris, I am beyond fired up to be with you today, my friend. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, growing up, you're always a big baseball player. You know, everybody said, like, you could throw faster than the 12-year-olds, and you were, you know, seven. So, uh, I mean, from a young age, like, baseball meant a lot to you. Uh, you know, what what did baseball really mean to you? Yeah, I'm impressed. You've done your research. You yeah. found that in an old article, which I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love the game. You know, I think uh, as a kid, and, and you know this, when you fall in love with a sport, you want to keep playing it. You want to have as many games as you can. You want as many practices. You want to keep getting out there. And uh, it was one thing that as a kid, I loved practicing. And it's something you think about when you get into business and whatever you do, you have to love when no one else is watching. And for me, I loved the practice. I love batting practice. I love going out and throwing bullpens with my dad and, and you know, feeling till the, light, uh, till the sun went down and working on all the time. I fell in love with the game and I found out I was pretty good at it. And uh, my dad said, Jesse, you're not going to college unless you get a full scholarship. And so he would have helped me take care of me. But I had that mindset as a kid. I got to be so good in athletics, baseball, and academics to get a full scholarship. And uh, I was so fortunate uh, to get that opportunity to get a full scholarship to play Division One baseball down in South Carolina. And, um, you know, my goal, like many kids, is to play professional. And I'll never forget, you know, uh, when I was a senior in high school and I received my first letter from the Atlanta Braves. And then I received a letter from the Pittsburgh Pirates. And I went to college and uh, I received Christmas cards from the New York Mets and the San Diego Padres. I was like, this is going to happen. I was like, this is amazing. And I visualized that phone call on draft day. Jesse was going to let you know we've selected you in that 45th round. I don't care what round it was to get that opportunity. And uh, uh, fortunately, and I'm saying fortunately, that never happened, Chris. Fortunately, because I tore my shoulder, I got injured, and I went into what I was really supposed to do, and that's put on a show and entertain people from uh, the front office aspect. So uh, that's where it all worked out, but it all started with the love of the game. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned that injury. So you go to Wofford, uh, you know, have a stellar career, get injured, though, and then you become an intern and then the general manager of the Gastonia Grizzlies. So, like, when did you realize that, you know, you don't want to be, like, a baseball player, you don't want to just own a team, you want to be a showman? <laughs> well, it was it was a, a, a step process. I think, uh, you know, I remember I was a professional baseball player. I wanted to be that always. And then I was like, I'm going to be a coach. You know, most players, they want to coach. They want to be on the field. And I coached in the Cape Cod League, which I'm sure you're familiar with, Chris, one of the best leagues, the best players. And uh, I had the front row seat. I'm sitting in the dugout with the best players in the country. And I realized very quickly that I was bored. I loved playing the game, but there's a difference about watching the game. And so for that, it was like, I don't want to necessarily coach and be on the field. And so I took a chance. I took an internship, getting paid nothing, zero dollars. And I was given a phone book and said, sell sponsorships. And it was crazy. But I loved the idea of selling people to come out to the ballpark. And uh, once I got that opportunity as a GM, I got to be able to create my own idea of what the game should be like. And it shouldn't be just about baseball. It should be about entertainment. And I wanted to make baseball fans out of people that don't like baseball. I remember, Chris, I had so many people would say, ah, I don't like baseball. I'd say, perfect. You'll love our shows. Because I went the opposite route. I wanted people to actually come into the ballpark and give us a chance and watch the, watch the dancing players and watch the grandma beauty pageants and have a donut dog and donut burger and garbage can nachos. That's what I wanted. And uh, I was able to make an impact. And obviously that jumped into ownership. And now, uh, really, we just run a three-ring circus here at the ballpark every night, and it's a lot of fun. And I'm a big soccer guy. So, I mean, I love all sports, but, you know, soccer – and there's yes. a third division team, so obviously not, you know, this huge club in Madison, Wisconsin. And they bring, like, cows to the game. I mean, they're doing these crazy – they have, like, these jerseys that are absolutely, you know, uh, like flamingos everywhere. It's crazy what they do. But it kind of re reminded me of you in a sense when I saw you. I'm like, this what they're doing. And I kind of really appreciate teams that do that because, to me, I, as a fan, I would love to go to one of those games, you know. And not just the game, but the show, as you mentioned. So, uh – you, you and your Brenda uh, friends brainstormed some teams, and after you guys started, you know, or saw like an increase in attendance and sponsorships. So, like, how long did it take from getting the idea to, uh, you know, at the Grizzlies? Like, how how did you get fans into the stadium? 
<laughs> uh, people say, oh, you guys are an overnight success. Well, it's been 15 years in the industry. And before that, me and my friends used to come up with crazy ideas always. But, yeah, it, 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 it was tough. And, uh, it, it, you know, excuse the challenging language, but I think you always got to get through the suck. You got to get through the challenges. You got to get through the, the, the things when it, it's tough. And I think so many people give up. They give up because it gets hard. And, you know, I couldn't pay myself my first three months. So, Chris, imagine you get out of college, you take your first job, and you can't even get a paycheck. And not for just two weeks, but four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, ten weeks, because there's no money. There was only $200 in the bank account, 268 to be exact. And so I had to get through that challenge. But I realized it was something worth doing. And so, um, yeah, we would just start thinking about what will get people excited about coming to a ballpark. And, you know, we buried a diamond ring in the infield dirt. You know, we had uh, world's largest pillow fight on the field. We had DJs and bands not playing pregame, not playing postgame, playing during the game. You know, we had a game that started at midnight. I mean, we just started doing Midnight Bandits and all these different crazy promotions to make it fun. And I think when you're trying to chase down fun and have fun and give fun, it makes it easy to get through the challenges. And every day I was like, what's going to happen to the ballpark? Like, we'd have accordion players just going through the stadium. The players would be out dancing and doing conga lines in the middle of the games. Our players went on dates with fans in the middle of the games, Chris. It was crazy. But people were like, you never know what's going to happen at the ballpark tonight. And I think that's a pretty fun thing. You know, most ball games, even soccer, to an extent, you don't know who's going to win. But you know how the game may go. You know, all right, this is what they're going to do before the game. This is what they're going to do at halftime. It's the same stuff over and over again. That's boring to me. I want I want every night to have something happen that's never happened. And that's how we try to create it for our fans so they're so excited to come to our ballpark. And obviously, we went from a couple hundred fans to a thousand fans to two thousand fans to start selling out games. And that really, you know, helped us go into Savannah with a game plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, while in uh, with the Grizzlies still, you met, you know, uh, uh, you know, your future wife. So, I mean, all of that happens, you know, your wife's friend tells you about you and then all of this happens. So like, talk about how you met Emily and, you know, what she means to you and, uh, what she's done for, you know, both of your careers in a sense. Well, let me just say this first. I've done over 250 or 300 of these podcasts and you may be one of the top 1% as far as preparation, my friend, and knowing this background of the story. And I'll tell you, one of the biggest keys to success is being prepared. And my friend, I, I am very impressed with you. So, yes, okay. you know the backstory. Uh, uh, my wife, I met her uh, in the industry. I was given a talk about the grandma beauty pageants and salute to underwear nights. And her boss overheard what I was saying and called her and said, I met the guy you're going to marry. Emily was so passionate about what we do. Um, she's the kind of girl that... Uh, when she showed up that first day as our director of fun, she put on a hot dog costume and was just going around the stadium in a hot dog costume. And Chris, I'll tell you this, a girl that's not that's willing to get in a hot dog costume and not worry about her hair and her makeup and how she looks, all right, for me, that's a confident girl. And that was a girl that I was impressed with. And so uh, uh, we hit it off immediately. And of course, you know, uh, being the showman, I had to propose in a unique way. So I stopped the game in the middle of the game, the last game of the season, and uh, um, had a, a ring inside a baseball. And... Uh, literally at home plate uh, proposed to her and had a fireworks show go off in the middle of the game. And the umpires were like, when are we going to play again? I'm like, this is our moment. You don't take this away. And the fans are all cheering. And we had both of our families there. Uh, and it really, um, you know, showed how we do things. We make things big. We make them fun. We make them over the top. And the fact that Emily has supported me and been along this journey is, is pretty cool. So that's future for you, but look, yeah. for, look for someone, Chris, I'll tell you that, that you can have fun with. Yeah. And that's not too worried about what other people think. Is just worried about having fun and doing the right thing, and uh, I found that with Emily. And it's funny because it only happened a few months after you guys met, too. So it's like you're propo- asking this, you know, Emily, to, you know, to marry you only a few months after you guys met. But I guess it was well. No, we we actually met year we met years yeah. ago. So we yeah. we were together. We were we even we were together for years. We uh, the first time I, I met her uh, was back many years ago. So we've actually been, we worked together for about a year before I proposed. Because the article was like, for after a few months, Jesse Cole proposed. I'm like, what in the earth? Yeah, they, they, they want to, yeah, again, that, that's something from P.T. Barnum, probably someone was following in his footsteps. Yeah. Make the story seem bigger than it is. That actually is not completely yeah, true. Yeah, because I was, I was laughing when I read that. I was like, how is that possible? But it makes all, <laughs> all makes sense now. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, you, she takes you to this game in Savannah. You fall in love with the city, just like I did when I went to Savannah. It's a hard city to not like, you know, these trees everywhere and everything. So uh, was it kind of love at first sight like it was with Emily, or did it kind of take – was it just like another road trip for you? 
I love the city, but um, as much as I love the city, I love the ballpark. And, you know, Chris, you've been to probably some different stadiums, arenas. When you first walk in, there's moments that you don't forget. And I grew up in Boston, all right, and uh, I grew up south of Boston, and I was fortunate to be the bat boy for the Red Sox for a game when I was five years old and sit in the dugout with, you know, Roger Clemens and Wade Boggs. It was so cool. Um, but I remember every single time I would come to Fenway and I would walk up that grandstand and the first time I would see the field and it was just blown away. And I was fortunate to be able to go to probably a hundred games as a kid. I had that same feeling walking into Grayson stadium. Now Grayson stadium built in 1926. All right. We'll give, go back to your history. FDR gave a presidential address here. FDR. All right. Babe Ruth played here. Hank Aaron played here. Lou Gehrig played here. Ted Williams played here. Jackie Robinson played here. It, I can just list the whole Hall of Fame. They played at the stadium. When I walked in that first game, and a former professional team was playing there, and there was only a couple hundred people in the stadium, I was blown away. I felt like a kid in a candy store. I was like, this is the most majestic, beautiful stadium I've ever seen. Where is everybody? And there was no one there. And I fell in love, and I said, this city... This country, this community, they need this ballpark to be full of life and energy and bringing people together. And for 90 years, unfortunately, it never really hit all cylinders. And so I was driven by that purpose. And I said, this is where we're going. And uh, we knew it was going to be a challenge, but we never knew it was going to be that big of a challenge when we first came. Yeah, and I mean, speaking of a challenge, so the months go by, you you know, the team obviously folds, and then you have to start your own team in this stadium. That's what you decide to do, because this stadium's yep. too hard to not pass up on. But uh, you just bought your dream house. You have to sell it. I mean, like, and then you kind of hit rock bottom, because you move to Savannah, nobody's buying tickets, and, you know, you're living in this duplex on an air mattress. So, like, mentally, what is going on, you know, through your head at this point in your life? What would you have done? What would, if you showed up and literally everything was taken out of the stadium and you sell two total tickets in the first three months and by the fourth month you're completely out of money, what would you do? Honestly, I, I just I don't know at this point. Uh, I might have to call it a day. But, you know, I'd, I'd try. I mean, I'd do what Jesse Cole does. So, Jesse, what would you do? <laughs> Good way of turning it. Uh, we believed in it. So, you know, if you really believe in something, you're going to work harder at it. You're going to find ways to get through the challenges. And we believed in it. We believed a fun, nonstop, entertaining ball and park experience would be worth it for fans. We believe making every ticket all-inclusive, including all your burgers, your hot dogs, your chicken sandwiches, your soda, your water, your popcorn, dessert, everything, for $15 would be worth it. We believed in that. We just knew we had to get their attention. And we didn't – at that point, we hadn't earned the attention of the fans. And I think everyone, so many people, Chris, they come into a community like owners, sports team, like the community has to support us. You know, we're here. We need the community to support us. No, you need to earn the support of the community. We hadn't earned it the first five months. We were like everyone else. We were doing things like everyone else. So when we came out, named the team the Savannah Bananas, came up with a senior citizen dance team called the Banana Nanas, came up with a male cheerleading team called the Mananas, came up with a break dancing first base coach who dances every game, came up with a banana baby that we lift every game before the game like Simba in The Lion King, came up with a music video, Can't Stop the Peeling, with our players in a music video, <laughs> came up with all the dancing players, the banana, banana pep band, came up with all the shenanigans. Then we earned the attention and the right to put on a good experience here at the ballpark. You got to earn it. And we hadn't earned it the first six months. And so there was a reason why we were sleeping on an air bed uh, and uh, without out of money, but we got through that. And I think so many people, so many business people, entrepreneurs, they, they aren't willing to get through those challenges in diversity. And we, based on the huge support from my wife, and the great team we had. We had a president, 24 years old, who was all in. We had three 22-year-olds right out of college. I mean, think of this. I mean, just a few years after you, out of college, we're not even succeeding. We haven't sold any tickets, but they stayed with us. And that uh, that made it really all worth it and made us earn uh, what, what happened. And obviously selling out every game and the wait list in the thousands and what's happened, I think uh, our staff deserves a lot of credit, and my wife especially. Yeah, and it you know kind of frustrates me when teams, especially minor league teams, because you're like your name. Well, I mean your name does the bananas, but like you're not the New York Yankees in the sense that you're one of the most historic teams on the planet. You know, so like you have to really put yourself out there and do something different. As you can tell, you're wearing a yellow tuxedo, but uh, so you gotta you gotta really put yourself out there. And I think you've done a 
I'd say a fantastic job at that. So, uh, now, you, you mentioned your wife. Like, what was she thinking throughout this process of you guys, you know, kind of hitting rock bottom? Well, Emily is very special in so many ways. And uh, she grew up in a, a, a family. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I got uh, three brothers, one sister, so pretty big family. All right. And I think, you know, at this point, Chris, you know, you, do you have younger brothers, younger sisters? Uh, just one. I'm the fourth. One. You're in the middle, you're the early in the middle, but I bet you that your older brothers would do anything to protect you. They would do anything for you. And when you become a family, the brothers, you do everything for them. And I was an only child. I, I was I was unfortunate. I didn't get to have any of that. But Emily was the oldest. She had three brothers, and her family was the tightest family. And she would do anything for them. And that's the mindset of Emily. Emily is, I'm going to, hey, if we got to pack up, sell our house, you know, go to Walmart and, and eat food, which is not even food. I mean, like, like barely hot pockets. Um, and we'll do it. And so Emily packed up her bags, left her family to come with me to support that. And I think that's the kind of person that she is. And if you look behind any more impressive, more valuable, more supportive. And so that was Emily's mindset. Let's go down. I'm going to be there. I'm going to, she, we did walks. I mean, Chris, I remember when we had no money and we were struggling, we weren't, weren't sleeping. We were on an airbed and middle of the night at two, three in the morning, we would just go walk the two of us out on the streets you know, on the sidewalks, just talking. And she did that with me. And I think uh, that is one of the big reasons we were able to get through this is I was like, the world's caving in. She's like, we're going to get through it. We're going to get through it. Yeah. And so uh, I think that's really important. Yeah, well, you need those type of people, you know, surround yourself with people that are better than you. So uh, what happens is, you know, you name your team the banana too. So like, was that kind of the moment, like the aha moment when you all of a sudden saw fans come into the stadiums? Did it take a little longer than that? Like, what was it like? Yeah, again, we had no idea what we were doing. So, like, <laughs> our first shipment of T-shirts came in, and bananas was spelled wrong with too many ends. Like, you know, we had no idea how to ship merchandise overseas. We were charging five bucks when it was costing us twenty bucks. Um, when we named the team nationally, yeah, it was number one trending on Twitter. If you can find a way to be number one trending on Twitter, all right, we're on to something. <laughs> but lo locally, the trend was criticized. But here's the important thing, Chris. They were talking about us. You know, I don't like the saying that, you know, uh, uh, all publicity is good publicity or bad publicity is, you know, I don't I don't agree with that. But I do agree with what can you do to get people talking? P.T. Barnum was a wizard at this. Walt Disney was amazing at this. Richard Branson was amazing at this. Steve Jobs was amazing at this. Elon Musk was amazing at this. You look at all the greatest um, some of the greatest entrepreneurs, they find ways to get people talking. And the only way you get people talking is if you do something worth talking about. If you do something that's normal, like Chris, if you want to stand out, don't just follow what everyone else is doing. Get out of what everyone else is doing and do something completely different. And so we knew naming the team after fruit, naming a, uh, our mascot split, you know, naming the, the banana nanas, all these different things were like, whoa, these guys are different. These guys are fun. And then they came into our website and like, whoa, every ticket's all inclusive. Wait, the players do choreographed dances? Who are these guys? I got to see it. And the best marketing in the world, what it does is it creates intrigue. It creates excitement. It creates questions saying this could be fun. And so that's what we were trying to do. And the name obviously worked wonders. And we've sold more merchandise. I mean, put it in perspective. In just our merchandise business, it's more than we did total revenue of all my years in the Grizzlies. So it just it just in merchandise, and that's not included like obviously tickets and sponsorship, everything in Gastonia. We've done more, so obviously the brand is connected with fans, uh, which has been fun. And they say the biggest thing uh, is the word of mouth. I mean, like because once these people get to the stadium, they're customers at first, and they be all of a sudden they become fans. Tell their friends, mm -hmm. tell all their cousins, everybody, tell the family, and all of a sudden now you're generating even more people into the stadium. So now I talked about uh, what baseball means to you, but as you can all tell, you're wearing this yellow tuxedo, so you have six of them at home. Uh, like, what does this yellow tuxedo mean to you? Well, I have seven now, and, seven. and the tux means everything. And I'm going to – I, I uh, it's my uniform. Uh, you said you play soccer. All right, when you're out practicing soccer, maybe in the backyard, maybe with your friends, there's a difference than the day you put on the uniform. When you put on your game uniform, it's game time. You have a whole other level of adrenaline, excitement going into the game. When I put this on, this is my uniform. When I put it on, it's showtime. So that's what it means. It means about standing out, being different, and hopefully giving people permission to have fun. You know, as the owner of the team, if I'm just dressed like in a full 
like regular suit and a tie and very professional looking and no facial hair and no fun. That's the, the mindset that gets, you know, brought down to the rest of the team. So, you know, I, I think what you said before, though, was about turning customers into fans. That was that was really the big thing that we realized is how do you turn how do you create fans? Everything we do, how do you create fans? And my question for you is you don't necessarily need to say a sports team, but maybe it's other you know, video games or brands or restaurants. What what are you a fan of, Chris? I'm intrigued. What are some things you're a fan of? I mean, you probably hit the nail on the coffin, like sports. I love sports, but I also love kind of the, I mean, just business and learning because, uh, like, kind of growing a brand because I have a few Instagram pages. I'm trying to grow, scale up to a few thousand followers, and then from there, kind of, you know, it was a snowfall effect. You get more. So mm-hmm. I really like doing that, and, uh, Kind of just, you know, soccer and, like, talking to people like you right now, which is really fun and everything. Well, who do you follow? So, like, who on your Instagram or who, like, who are you a fan of? Oh, well, I'm a fan of all these teams. Uh, Forward Madison, as I mentioned, the soccer team, like, i become a fan of them. And my favorite soccer team. Why, now, yeah, you're in New Jersey. Yeah. Why are you a fan of Forward Madison? Because, I mean, their marketing is, like, what they do to, like, they just bring pa- cows to a game. They have these most, the crazy, like, the nicest but craziest jerseys ever. It's called, like, the drip kit. So it's, like, this pink and uh, blue everywhere. So it's really cool. And then my other favorite teams uh, in England, which they were in the fourth division at the time when I started supporting them. They worked their way up to the second now, which is one step behind the biggest league in the world, the Wickham Wanderers. I'm a huge fan of them. My fans call me crazy. Like my, my friends call me crazy for it. But you know, this is my team. Why are you a fan? Why are you a fan of them? Uh, well, in FIFA, probably 2013, I was playing as them, and I just decided that would be my favorite team. But I mean, ever since then, I become a fan, and they have one of the most marketable player, marketable players, Akin Fenwa, who looks like a football linebacker even bigger, but he's a striker for a soccer team. Now, do you have any merchandise of that team or the the soccer team? Yeah, the team in England. I have some merchandise of. Yeah, and so you buy their merchandise. You've never been to a game, right? I will, but yeah, never been to a game. They're overseas. You become a fan, and do you watch the games when you can? Yeah. All right. That's see. That's powerful. That's powerful. And so they became a fan because they kept showing up. They were better. They had a really interesting player to watch. The forward Madison's doing things that are different, that are wild. They do cool jerseys. When you're doing things that are different, people, you know, get attracted to them. And so I just think that's so cool. I'm always intrigued on why you're fans. I bet you you might follow them on Instagram or some of the other social platforms, right, just to see what they're doing, right? Yeah, and that's what they also, that's where they, like, they shine, that, you know, those teams on social media because they know young kids like me, I mean, that's what we go on. So it's like, I saw, I think it was you with TikTok. I, you put it on LinkedIn, like, you challenge your interns to do a TikTok challenge, which I found hilarious. But at the same time, that's genius because now you have a, like 100,000. I think it was you. Was it? Yeah. yeah. We're well over. Now we're 115,000 or whatever. Yes. Yeah. And that's something like, I'm not trying to say it's easy because I'm not famous on it yet, but like, that's something that, like, if you have a viral video, which is a lot more, like, easier than, like, let's say Instagram, YouTube. <laughs> I mean, yes. you can just start rolling with that and then you get a few thousand and it just keeps, you know, getting bigger. Yeah. Do you spend most of your time on TikTok or Instagram? Where do you spend most Probably of your time? Instagram, like Instagram, definitely, because that's where I run everything, like on my on my social medias. But I'll go on TikTok cool. and uh, Snapchat to text some friends or something. Cool. Love it. Cool. All right. Sorry, I, I had some interesting questions. That That's an important thing. That's why I think you're going to be so successful, Chris, is because you ask so many questions. Curiosity leads to creativity and you know it's huge it's huge and i think we need to ask more questions so thank you for asking some great questions but go on i'm not interrupting anymore i'll be better yeah no it's fine trust me uh because i just thought of it now because i started a soccer team a semi-pro soccer team back in two years ago i was like a i'm gonna be a freshman so like i was in sixth grade and uh, what happens is i start this team i get like players i get a player with two hundred fifty thousand followers on instagram uh he's like some like he does a bunch of these crazy tricks. I mean, the team never started, but I had these jerseys and everything. It was all laid out. I just didn't have the financial backing. That's all I needed. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I started a team. Let's, let's that. So you wanted to start a team, all right? So, so you started, you, you got these players, and they were going to play games. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and and so they couldn't start because you needed money. Is that correct? Yeah. What did you need money for? I need money to join First off, join a league, get the jerseys, get everything together. I mean, 
You have to have that. How much? How much is it to join a league? Cost about like five hundred, and then the jerseys were a few thousand. But my whole goal was to get the sponsors to pay. And what happened with with these sponsors? Because my whole goal, thing was like people call me crazy, but a like twelve year old, a thirteen year old, you know, thirteen year old kid starting a soccer team that would generate fans into a stadium. If you ask me, I mean that name alone. Yeah, hundred percent. Don't get stopped by the money. We didn't have any money. Just I'm gonna give me this like, hey, if that's that's a goal for yours, if that's a goal for you, don't don't stop. You know, f- find a way. If it's say five hundred bucks or two thousand dollars, first of all, don't jerseys can be donated. There's ways to get them traded. I we actually a lot of our jerseys we don't pay for at all. We get a trade for them because we also buy some and sell some. There's ways to trade. The five hundred dollars. I bet you there's a way if you say this is what we're doing and start a Kickstarter or something. Hey, can you give $10 for starting a team? We got this. I'm 13, 14 years old. This is what I'm doing. Find a way. It's a great story, Chris. I don't I don't want to deter you, but I'm just saying, like, you can do that. And how cool would that be to say, yeah, when I was 14 years old, in the middle of a pandemic, I decided I was going to, you know, we tried a few years ago, but I said, you know what? I'm going to push now. I'm going to push. And we're going to try to start this team. And we're going to play in the spring of 2021. We're going to play five games, three games, two games. And I'm going to help lead that. Set that goal and set a date. I'm going to play our first game here. This is what we're going to do. The greatest creativity comes when you add a constraint. Set the date. Are we ready on opening day every year? You better believe we're not. We're not. We're not ready. But we put the date and we make it happen. And we're better by the next game. You set that date, you make it happen. So I challenge you, if you really want to do that, I think you can. You can make it so set a date. We're going to play here. Set a date to get the jerseys. Set a date to say, I'm going to put some jerseys on sale or whatever. There's ways to do it. I, I, I hope uh, I hope you don't uh, get well, discouraged. I think yeah, there's an opportunity for you. Now, her goal in a few years ago, about Thanksgiving time too, it was to knock on people's houses all around the town. So I'm in a town, not a small, small town, but like a town of yeah. 25, 30,000 people. Knock on houses, say, if you donate X amount of money, I'll give you two, or, you know, amount of tickets. Let's say two or three tickets to the first game. So mm-hmm. if they would donate to the team that could help launch the team, and they'd become founding members, that would be like the whole thing, you know. Yep. And like they get on some banner and everything, they give me the money. I'd give them tickets. And what happens is, once they get the tickets, they're gonna fall in love. Um, how we were working on it, but they were gonna fall in love with the idea of this team. And are going to keep on coming, and then that's how we would generate, you know, a revenue and eventually, you know, a profit as well. Remember, set a number, create mm-hmm. demand. I'm going to have. We're only going to have a hundred founding members, and it's it's a hundred bucks a, a person, fifty bucks a person, whatever that is. You know what fifty times a hundred is? Like, uh, five thousand. Yeah. yeah. How do you think five thousand would do as far as your startup costs? I think that would do pretty well, if you ask me. That would cover your jerseys. That would cover your lead. That would cover everything. So if you said, hey, 150 bucks, they get uh, a T-shirt with with your logo on it. They get so and so. I mean, you can do it, man. I'm I'm excited. I I want to I want to see you make this happen because I think it would be it, amazing. Jesse. You know what, Jesse? Right now, I'll promise you that I will do this within. A, I'll set a date. I'll message you, and I'll do everything to start this because this was a huge dream. Like I worked months at this. I contacted leagues. I scheduled business calls. I eventually had to back out because I was too young. Because you know. But uh, I tried to get my dad to do it. My dad's like, what am I doing right now? So I was like, if they ask you this, say this. I, I set out all these hypotheticals and stuff. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's how it you know, really happened. I love it. The best, the best pitch is I can say, all right, here's why this won't work. People will say I'm too young. People will say I don't know what I'm doing. That's people will say that. You have all the reasons why people will say this won't work. Is and then say, mean? but I think it can. Yeah, and it's funny because you say I'm too young. I think that's exactly why it will work because I am too young. Like that's yeah. breaking the, you know, the barrier. And you don't know any better, and that's the best thing, Chris. I'm telling you, people that are in an industry for way too long that learn everything, they get bound to the way things are supposed to be. You don't know how to start a team. You don't know how to do that. That's the best thing you have going for you because everyone else that follows what everyone else does, they people don't care about it. You're. You're a 14 year old. It's like, I'm going to start a team and this is what I'm going to do. And everything you do is an experiment and a test and you'll learn from that. The key is to just start, to just start doing it because you won't learn anything until you do. Yeah. And so knocking on doors, heck yeah, it might have to be different during coronavirus, but mm-hmm. finding ways to reach out, do it. And the yeah. fact that you're doing it right now is a better story. Hey, there's no live sports going on right now. Like, give me an example. We're playing in front of more fans 
right now than any baseball team in the country because we found a way. We said we're going to do it, we're going to make it safe, and we're going to find a way. Masks, te check temperatures, COVID tests, we did it all, but we found a way. And now where everyone else is going out of business, we're playing in front of fans and building more fans. Right now, yeah, starting a soccer team in the middle of a pandemic, and I'm 14 years old, you're crazy. But we need more crazy. And I challenge you to do this, Chris, because I'm telling you, you're inspiring me and you're going to inspire so many more people if you make it happen. Well, thank you. And I mean, I will. I'll, you know, I'm going to, I'll message you. I'll do everything. I'll set these dates and all. So, uh, I mean, getting back on track to this interview here, we had a nice little pit stop. But, uh, yeah, you're a published author, uh, you know, called Find Your Yellow Tux, How to Be Successful by Standing Out. So, like, what inspired you to write a book and, you know, how long did it take? Uh, 15 years in the making, you know, it's all your, all my stories. So it's everything that I've done, but, yeah. um, yeah, I, I, uh, had an opportunity. I wrote thank you letters. I started in 2016 writing a thank you letter every day. Um, and you want to talk about something that can be a game changer in your life, Chris, write handwritten thank you letters to people. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. I have saved every single thank you letter I've received over the last five years. I got a big box and it means the world to me. Emails you forget. Text messages you may forget, but you never forget a handwritten thank you letter. And I started in 2016 writing thank you letters, and one of them was to Mike Michalowicz, who is the author of Profit First, a speaker. And when I read his book, when we were sleeping on an airbed and had no money, um, there was a whole chapter on you need to enjoy saving more than spending. And my wife and I saved every penny we could, and it helped us get through that challenge and go from $1.8 million in debt. So, Chris, you're talking about a couple thousand dollars, which I know for 14 years old is big. We all had almost $2 million in debt. And Mike, in his book, and some of the things we learned helped us get through that. So I wrote him a handwritten thank you letter. And he goes, oh, my God, this is amazing. Can you come on my podcast? Just like you, I went on his podcast. He goes, oh, can you be a keynote speaker at our event? I said, yeah, of course, Mike. I spoke at his event in front of all accountants, you know, people that have nothing to do with baseball or the entertainment. And the topic of the speech was how to stand out, how to be different. And we called it Find Your Yellow Tux. And I spoke and received an amazing standing ovation, which I'll never forget. And uh, uh, they said, you got to write a book on it. So I went out and wrote a book. And it took months and months and months. And um, am I completely happy with it? No, but that's okay. The reality is I put it out a couple of years ago. Um, is it my best work? No, but it's just in a bat. I came up, I came swinging. And now I'm ready for my next at bat. And you better believe there's another book coming out in the next year or so. So, you know, get it out. Just start. And I just started and uh, it's made a bigger impact because people have read it and it's inspired them. Yeah, and it made a big, big impact on you. Uh, your public speaking requests uh, spiked by 500% I saw. So that's, you know, absolutely, you know, crazy. Like how, how one book could kind of change your life in a sense. So, uh, you know, you also have a kid now. So you kind of, I feel like you watched the bananas grow up. You know, you kind of started them. That's your kid. And you actually have, you know, an actual son. So like how we you know, like, what's it like kind of watching your son grow up and, like, how rewarding is it? Oh, jeez, it's a, a big perspective change. And you'll learn that maybe late, much, much, much later in your life. But it's a, it's a huge perspective change. You know, um, you know, my favorite moments are with him. You know, I love being at the ballpark. But my favorite moments are, you know, uh, laughing with him and singing with him and hearing him do the alphabet. And now he does all the promotions, so the Bananas promotions. So he watches our games on our streaming. So we have all the games on, on an iPad, and, and he watches them. And he'll he'll do, you know, uh, he'll, he'll say, uh, play ball, go Bananas. And he'll start doing the Hey Baby dance. And he'll say, go Bananas. And he watches the games. And uh, every night before I put him down, he says, can you sing me, uh, sing ballpark, sing ballpark. And take me out to the, and he says, ballpark. He doesn't say ball game. He says ballpark. Yeah. But he's two years old. And uh you know, it's those moments and memories. And I think one thing I've learned, Chris, is uh, often we're so focused on what's next. What do we got to do? Our chores, the work we have to do. You know, you're saying, all right, what am I going to do after this podcast? Mm -hmm. What I've learned from Maverick is being in the moment, literally being in the moment and just laughing so hard. The other day, uh, we played the cha-cha slide on Alexa at the house. And he's two years old. And he's doing the cha-cha slide. Slide to the left. You go, slide left. And he goes, slide right. And he goes, cha-cha-cha-cha. And he does the cha-cha. Yeah. I'm not thinking about anything else. And the same thing happens at our games after the night when the band's playing, the DJ's rocking, and we're just dancing with fans. Even with our masks on and gloves on, we're dancing with fans. How can you find things where you truly lose yourself in the moment? That, to me, is real fulfillment, real fun, and everything we should be looking for. And so uh, I try to really relish those moments with uh, my son, Maverick. Yeah, now... Uh... 
uh, that's, you know, amazing. And, you know, kind of to wrap up here, without saying I, you know, the word I, so, like, I, you know, who is Jesse Cole? <laughs> uh, still a kid trying to make his dad proud, uh, but now trying to make his wife and his son proud. You know, great, and uh, he definitely inspired me with that, you know, little pit stop, that's what I'll call it, that we had there, but uh, it was truly, you know, I listened to every word you said, I just want you to know that, and, you know, I appreciate what you said and everything, and uh, I appreciate you coming on to this, you know, little YouTube channel I have here, and the Instagram page, so I love everything you're doing, um, as all my family probably knows, I'm a big supporter of these people that are, you know, you know, especially these lower league, you know, people that are, you know, working hard to make their uh, team a you know, this successful team. So thank you, Jesse, you know, for coming on and, you know, best of luck with everything and stay healthy. Thanks, Chris. And I'll say this, uh, your parents should be tremendously proud of what they've raised with you. And uh, I have been thoroughly impressed. One of the best interviews I've ever been on, um, your preparation, uh, the way you've gone from question to question, very talented. And I'm telling you this, and I, and I mean it, uh, reach out however I can help. I love your what you're trying to do. And I can see you doing amazing things, and you're going to make a huge impact in the world. And I'm excited to follow along and help in any way. So keep me updated on what you're doing, Chris, and I appreciate yeah. you, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Jesse. And uh, everybody, go get your banana merch or whatever you want. Check out the website. I'll link everything in the description. And Jesse, I mean, thanks again, and, you know, hope you and your family are, you know, staying healthy. We are. Thanks a lot, Chris. Appreciate yeah. you, man. Thank you. See ya.